Hello, and welcome to this presentation on Understanding Free Space Path Loss. In this short presentation, we'll discuss the basics of free space path loss and the most common calculations and equations used in free space path loss applications. As the name implies, free space path loss refers to the loss of signal strength, or the attenuation of a signal, as it travels through a path in space. As we'll see in this presentation, this loss is a function of two variables the distance the signal travels, as well as the frequency of the signal. One very important thing to remember about free space path loss is that it is a calculation, not a measurement. This presentation will explain the fundamentals of free space path loss with as little math as possible. But if you'd like to go deeper into the formulas, these can be found in ITU recommendation P525-2, Calculation of Free Space Attenuation. And lastly, Free space path loss calculations are only applicable in the far field, that is, when we're not in very close proximity to the transmitting antenna. This isn't normally an issue, since free space path loss calculations are usually made for very long distances, well outside of the near field. We mentioned that free space path loss is a calculation, not a measurement. So how and where would we actually use free space path loss calculations? The main application for free space path loss is estimating the best case of path loss for a given distance and frequency. In other words, what is the minimum signal loss along a given path? A good example of this is satellite signals, where the path between the space vehicle and the ground antenna is about as close to free space as possible. In most other applications, however, the actual path loss between transmitter and receiver will be higher than this best case calculation. This is mostly due to obstructions or objects located along the path. More on this in a bit. It's also good to keep in mind that basic free space path loss calculations don't include things like antenna gain, losses in cables and connectors, transmitter power, receiver sensitivity, etc. So let's look at the actual free space path loss equation. We compute free space path loss, usually called A for attenuation, between isotropic antennas using a rather uncomplicated formula, A equals 20 log of 4 pi d over lambda, where lambda is wavelength in meters and d is distance in kilometers. We can make our lives even easier by rewriting this equation in decibel form as A equals 32.4 plus 20 log d plus 20 log f, where f is frequency in megahertz. This is a much more convenient way of calculating the free space path loss for most applications, and this is the formula that we'll use in the rest of this presentation. As mentioned earlier, and as we can see from these equations, free space path loss is a function of only two variables, distance d and frequency f. Let's look at how each of these variables contributes to our equation. The relationship between free space path loss and distance is fairly intuitive. As you probably already know, a signal that is transmitted by an isotropic radiator in free space propagates outwards in the form of a sphere. Remember that the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi d squared, where d is the radius of the sphere. You might be wondering why we're using d instead of r for radius. The reason is that in free space path loss equations, we use d to represent the distance from the source, which in this case is the center of our sphere. So as the sphere expands, that is, as the signal moves further away from the source, the signal intensity or power will decrease as per the inverse square law. This is why free space path loss increases as the distance from the source increases. We can represent this mathematically using the equation s equals ptx times 1 over 4 pi d squared, where s is the power density, p sub tx is the total radiated or transmit power, and d is the distance from the antenna, that is, the radius of the sphere. Again, it should be fairly easy to see why path loss increases as distance from the transmitter increases. It's perhaps a little less easy to intuitively understand why free space path loss depends on the frequency of the signal. There's a very common misconception that free space attenuates higher frequency signals more than lower frequency signals. This is incorrect, because free space, that is, a vacuum, doesn't attenuate signals at all, regardless of frequency. And while it's true that many physical objects, including air, will attenuate signals in a frequency-dependent way, free space path loss is a free space calculation, which assumes there are no objects, including air, 
between the transmitter and receiver. So why is free space path loss frequency dependent? First, remember that free space path loss assumes isotropic antennas at both ends. The effective aperture, or receiving area, of an isotropic antenna, A sub E, is a function of the wavelength lambda of the signal. That is, as the wavelength decreases, or the frequency increases, the effective aperture decreases. A smaller aperture means less signal received. So free space path loss is frequency dependent because the effective aperture of an isotropic radiator changes with frequency. But doesn't the atmosphere attenuate signals? Well, yes it does. However, in many cases we can safely treat the Earth's atmosphere as free space, especially for frequencies below about 10 GHz. Above 10 GHz, however, path loss can be influenced by the presence of both water and oxygen molecules in the atmosphere, and this loss is frequency dependent, with very significant attenuation peaks occurring at certain frequencies. For example, the first attenuation peak due to water vapor occurs at about 22 gigahertz, and the first attenuation peak due to oxygen occurs at about 63 gigahertz. So the actual real-world path loss near these frequencies will be substantially higher than what we calculate using our free space path loss equations. These are important considerations in the design of real-world systems at millimeter wave frequencies, but strictly speaking, these are not part of the free space path loss calculation. There is, however, a very common modification to the basic free space path loss equation with regards to antennas. Recall that the basic free space path loss equations assume isotropic radiators on both ends, that is, antennas with essentially zero gain. Isotropic antennas are, however, a mostly theoretical construct and aren't normally found in real world applications. For this reason, the free space path loss equation is often modified to include the gain of both the transmitting and receiving antennas, in this case, g sub tx and g sub rx, these gains being defined relative to an isotropic radiator. In this case, the free space path loss equation now becomes a equals 32.4 plus 20 log d plus 20 log f minus gtx minus grx. Let's work through a realistic free space path loss calculation, including the transmit and receive antenna gains. A GPS satellite at a distance of 20,200 kilometers transmits its L1 signal at 1575 MHz using 50 watts and an antenna with 13 dB of gain. What is the received signal strength on Earth if our receiver has an antenna with 3 dB of gain? We'll start with our decibel version of the free space path loss equation and after substituting values for distance, frequency, and antenna gain, we end up with a path loss or attenuation of 168.4 dB. Since our transmit power of 50 watts is 47 dBm, this means that our receive level will be approximately minus 121.4 dBm. Remember that free space path loss is usually a very good approximation for satellite systems, especially when atmospheric attenuation is negligible. One of the main reasons why free space path loss works well for satellite systems is that these systems are essentially line of sight. Line of sight generally implies that there is a direct line between the transmitter and the receiver with no intervening objects. However, diffraction or scattering of signals means that objects can interfere with the signal even if they don't lie on a direct geometric line between transmitter and receiver. While this is uncommon in satellite systems, it does become a consideration in cases like terrestrial point-to-point -point microwave links. The regions in which objects have the potential to cause interference are called Fresnel zones. If radio signals are reflected by objects, they may take different length paths to the receiver and thus arrive out of phase. Destructive interference can result when these out-of-phase signals combine at the receiver. Fresnel zones, named after Augustin Jean Fresnel, a French mathematician and physicist, describe the radiation patterns caused by transmitted signal diffraction. Although Fresnel defined multiple zones, it's really only the first Fresnel zone that we need to consider in practical radio applications. It is, however, important to keep in mind that objects outside of a direct line of sight path can still cause interference if they lie within the first Fresnel zone. 
How do we define the boundaries of this first Fresnel zone? The radius r of the first Fresnel zone can be calculated as a function of distance and frequency using r equals 8.657 times the square root of d over f, where d is distance in kilometers and f is frequency in gigahertz. How do we use the first Fresnel zone in practical applications? First, a general rule of thumb is that 60% of the first Fresnel zone should be clear obstructions, or there should be a 0.6 Fresnel clearance. Secondly, for terrestrial links longer than several kilometers, the curvature of the Earth, also called Earth bulge, becomes a consideration. For example, over a distance of 5 kilometers, Earth bulge is only 0.37 meters, whereas over a 40 kilometer link, Earth bulge is 24 meters, which could enter the first Fresnel zone depending on link frequency. So in summary, free space path loss is a calculation used to estimate RF signal loss or attenuation as a function of both distance and signal frequency. The decibel version of the free space path loss equation is A equals 32.4 plus 20 log D plus 20 log F where d is in kilometers and f is in megahertz. This basic free space path loss equation is often supplemented by subtracting the gains of both the transmit and receive antennas. Free space path loss calculations presume an unobstructed line of sight, and atmospheric loss can usually be neglected below about 10 gigahertz. On the other hand, objects in the first Fresnel zone can create additional path loss, and the size of the first Fresnel zone depends on both the distance between the antennas as well as the signal frequency. This concludes our presentation on understanding free space path loss. Thanks for watching.